and welcome to part two of the Celtic History Podcast, which charts the history of Celtic Football Club from 1887 to the current day. In part one of the series, titled From Desperation to Celebration, Chris was joined by Jim Blythe and Paul McQuaid from the Celtic Grave Society, who detailed the formation of the club from the initial meeting in St Mary's Hall in 1887 to the year 1900. They discuss the social challenges faced by the Irish Catholic community throughout Scotland in the late 1800s that prompted the formation of the club and the determination of this community who came together to build the club's first stadium before moving to the site where Celtic Park currently sits. They go through the club's first match in 1888 and identify the people who influenced the direction the club would eventually take. The boys then continue through the early years, highlighting the successes that the club achieved. In the 1880s, Glasgow was among the most densely populated cities in Europe. Away from the mansions of the wealthy trade merchants, poverty was rife. We had the first Scottish Cup final, 1887. Uh, it was the biggest ever attendance in a game in Scotland, 15,000. Um, it was a really significant event, but there's no doubt that we drew huge support from the Irish community in Glasgow. The club purchased the land upon which the second stadium had been built for £10,000. Celtic Park, and the land that it was built on, now belonged to Celtic. The very first Celtic shirt to be worn by the players is a far cry from the green and white hoop shirt that is synonymous with our club today. And the committee members, senior individuals, um, a lot of them ended up in the pub game as well. Um, so we're, to an extent, you know, we're taking advantage of the fact that they had developed connections through Celtic. Um, so they were derided as, uh, at one point as um, six publicans in a glass. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe it in, lads. That's the smell of freedom. And we're dead. We're sat in the back seat and we breathe it in. Now we join Chris McGuigan for part two of the ten part series where he will cover the period 1900 to 1920. Chapter 2 Celtic Football Club 1900 to 1920 With the Scottish Cup securely locked in the Celtic Park Pavilion, the boys began the 20th century as proud holders of Scotland's Premier Football Trophy. But the early years of the new century would present fresh challenges for the Parkhead Club. Celtic were a team in transition and in the immediate seasons after their cup triumph of 1900, silverware had become a scarce commodity. There was also no shortage of rivals ready to lay down a marker as Scotland's leading football club. Ambition still burned brightly at Celtic Park though, and one man in particular was determined to return the boys to football's pinnacle. Appointed secretary manager in 1897, Willie Maley set about his task with determination and vigour. As a player, he had aided Celtic's rapid rise to become one of the finest sides in the country. Now he strived to build a club which would not only be the best in Scotland, but be renowned across Europe and beyond. Maley possessed an exceptional eye for raw ability. From the rough ground of the junior game, he unearthed a formidable array of talent. His energy and acumen ensured Celtic Park was a place where potential could flourish and thrive. Maley's teams were typically robust for the time, but they played a fast, flowing, attacking game. It was a thrilling brand of football, it was delighted and enthralled for support. Off the field, Maley was a pioneer, ever eager to push open new doors. With the zeal of a missionary, he set out to preach the Celtic Gospel, between 1904 and 1911, Celtic toured Europe on four occasions, visiting and winning admirers 
in eight different countries. However, this admiration of the Parkhead Club was not shared by some back home in Glasgow. With the strict amateurs of Queen's Park a dwindling force, Rangers were now viewed as the club most likely to present a long-term challenge to the boys. The boards of both clubs had enjoyed a mostly formal and polite relationship, with both fully recognising the business benefits of the rivalry. Indeed for some, this rivalry was little more than a cosy business relationship, and in 1904, a cartoon in the Scottish Referee referred to both clubs for the first time as the Old Firm. Rangers President John Newell Primrose, a politician, businessman and bigot with staunch anti-Catholic views, recognised how a religious aspect of a rivalry with Celtic would make his club more attractive to those throughout Scotland who resented the mere presence of the Irish Catholic community. The arrival in 1912 in Govan of the Belfast-based Holland and Wolf Shipbuilding Company added an extra impetus to Rangers' sectarian stance. A player's religion was now fundamental to recruitment at Rangers. Across the city, Willie Maley's stance on the matter was simple and beautiful. At Celtic Park, a man would be judged on his football alone. And as the first decades of the 20th century would prove, there were few better judges of a footballer than Maley. In the Scottish Cup final of 1904, a Jimmy Quinn hat-trick inspired Celtic to lift their first trophy in four years. Resplendent in their new-looked hoop shirts, the boys came from two goals down to defeat Rangers 3-2. It was a remarkable and dramatic victory which hinted at a bright future for the Celts. But no one could have expected the utter domination of Scottish football that was to follow. The boys would win the 1904-05 league championship after playoff victory against Rangers. The title was successfully retained during the next campaign. Better though was to follow. In 1907, Maley's men became the first Scottish team to claim the league and Scottish Cup double. They then underlined their superiority by repeating this remarkable feat the following season. A third successive double was denied in 1909 when the SFA withheld the cup after a riot marred the end of a drawn replay final with Rangers. Celtic would go on to claim six successive league titles. It was a remarkable accomplishment, and one achieved with an exhilarating attacking verb, which ensured the hoops were lauded as much for their style as their achievements. So welcome to chapter two of the Celtic History Podcast and I'm absolutely delighted that I have on the line today to talk about 1900 to 1920, Harry Brady from the Celtic Underground. How are you Harry? I am wonderful apart from the fact that uh, just before we, we started recording this you did put the willies up me by mentioning about ten things that I hadn't studied up for in this so... <laughs> <laughs> That's a, if there's long silences, you'll know what it is. <laughs> look, anybody listening to it won't even notice that. You know, we've got Google in front of us. We always go back and do a wee bit of revision while we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to cover 1900 right up to 1920. And we'll not just talk about the trophies won, um, but we want to talk about sort of, you know, Glasgow culture at the time. And also we've got the First World War in there and things like that as well. Um, but also, the this was the first real opportunity for Celtic supporters to don their conspiracy hats and think that everybody's against them, right? Uh, yeah, actually, you asked me to do 1900 to 1920, and I thought, oh, right, okay, I know some real basics here. And as I started looking into it, it could have been right now, Celtic fans were paranoid. Uh, there was a summit call because of the behaviour of Celtic and Rangers fans. Um, there was a Liberal government doing uh, uh, welfare, uh, in charge, doing welfare reforms. Uh, it, was, uh, it was all as it is just now. Why well, should it change, you know? <laughs> yeah, it could have been any period. There was, there was an anti-Celtic story in the Daily Record. Nothing changed. <laughs> 
<laughs> the first, actually, to, to get cracking right away, when you look at 1900, 1900 is a bit of a, a watershed as well in the history of the club because up till then, the main Glasgow Derby, the main Glasgow rival at that time was Queen's Park. And the cup final in 1900 sort of put an end to that as we saw the emergence of what was Rangers at the time. It's quite interesting. It was also the, the emergence of, of something that would also start to come in uh, as we saw the first Celtic Rangers replay required <laughs> <laughs> in the Scottish Cup. But I thought it was quite interesting because obviously I listened to the last one and, it, it, and actually 1900 is quite a good cutoff for the first period was Celtic forming. So there's a lot of story about this, getting the stadium and changing the stadium and, and the committee. And, and as I started to read into it, I really felt that 1900 was the cut-off point where the majority of talk starts to be around Celtic and starts to be around Celtic players and starts to be about the football and the rivalry with Rangers. And, and, and the dynamics of, of everything about the history of Celtic seems to change bang on, the, bang on the turn of the century where it becomes the football in the park and increasingly the rivalry with Rangers that starts to, to, to come to the fore. We heard in the, in, the, in the first podcast with Paul and Jim about Rangers, you know, they, they weren't the dominant team that they became at that stage. You know, when you talk about the Scottish Cup and their, their name isn't actually on the trophy, it's only on the plinth and stuff. But here was Queen's Park, who were, without doubt, the establishment club, uh, you know, playing at Hamden and sponsored by the, well, sponsored, owned, in fact, a better way to put it, uh, by the the what you would term as the establishment at the time. And after Celtic beat the 4-3 in the final, everything started to change a wee bit. Yeah, and, and I think I've always, and everything I read in, in this seemed to, to reconfirm it, Rangers were never this big Protestant bastion against Celtic at the beginning. But it did start to evolve that uh, these uh, upstart uh, Irish Catholic immigrants were winning, starting to win things. And and I think the establishment of Scotland then started to hunt around for a, a team who could compete with Celtic and start to beat them. And and you can see again at the turn of the century that that's when people start to see that Rangers can offer up the competition that, that seems to be not coming from Queen's Park, who've, who've been the establishment team for 20, 20 years in Scotland. And, and still, when they, when they won the final, uh, the irony of it all was that the, the final was played at Ibrox. Yes. I'm sure the final was at Ibrox because there was a problem with Hamden. Straight after the Scottish Cup final that had happened at, against Queen's Park, Celtic were invited to provide the friends of the opposition to Queen's Park for the official opening of the new Hamden Park. We'll obviously get to the Ibrox disaster in 1902 in a, in a few minutes and stuff. But the stadiums at that stage, although the crowds were starting to, to increase, there must have been so much danger going to watch a match at that, at that time. Well, if you look through the, the history of football disasters through the, through the UK, there is a raft of disasters. I think there was a, there was a disaster at Stamford Bridge at the turn of the century as well. Uh, there was the Ibrox disaster. And... Well, uh, because well, you just need to listen. You just need to read. I mean, obviously we can't see it, but you just need to read the accounts. Although they spent a lot of money on Celtic Park, it does come across that basically there was a series of mounds and a pitch in between it. So uh, I don't think health and safety was at the forefront of people's minds. But you're right. You're starting to see crowds of, you know, starting to get into the tens and twelves and thirteens and fifteen thousands as as regular amounts for people going to games round about the turn of the century. That's when football really starts to take off as a spectator sport. In 1898, Celtic director James Grant financed the construction of a new stand on the south side of the stadium. With the blessing of the Celtic board, the stand was intended to be used for Grant's own enterprising needs. The two-tier stand reached a height of 72 feet 
and was built in stilts to reach such a height. Included in the stand was a press gallery that could accommodate 60 people, 2,000 leather upholstered seats for the spectators, and even windows that could be closed over during inclement weather. A new road was even built to connect the stand to London Road behind it, a road we all now know as Kerrydale Street. The stand was opened on October 28th, 1899, as Celtic faced St Bernard's in the league match they would win 5-0. However, the stand was not without its faults. Many patrons complained about the number of stairs they had to negotiate to reach their seats, but perhaps the biggest complaint regarded the windows. Despite the best intentions to keep the spectators comfortable, the windows may indeed have kept the wind and rain out, but they also had the unfortunate habit of steaming up when the stand was occupied, therefore restricting the views of the spectators. The flaws were a disappointment, and ultimately an economic disaster for Grant. In 1904, Grant sold the stand to the club, although it continued to be named after the Celtic director. The windows were soon removed altogether, and the Grant stand quickly became the main seated area at Celtic Park, although that was largely influenced by another event of 1904. May of that year saw the loss of the North Stand at Celtic Park to fire. Although the fire had started on the eastern side of the stand, the wind quickly blew the fire across the stand towards the pavilion, whose top tier was also damaged, but fortunately not irrevocably. With both structures made primarily of wood and other inflammable materials, by the time the fire brigade arrived on the scene, there was no chance of saving the stand, and it took all their efforts to save the pavilion itself from the same fate. Prior to the fire in April that year, Celtic Park had played host to an international match between Scotland and England. The visitors won the match by a goal to nil, and it was the fifth such game between the two rivals in a decade. Unfortunately, it would also be the last at Celtic Park, as all future matches between the two teams in Scotland would take place across the river at Queen's Park's new home, Hamden Park. By 1905, the north side of Celtic Park had a new look, with a brand new enclosure built to replace the burnt down stand. With the seated Grant stand now in possession of the club, it was felt a covered standing section would better suit the needs of the Celtic support. That tradition of standing on the north side of the stadium would last for the next 90 years. Next to the stand, a refurbished pavilion following the fire damage also had a slightly different look having replaced the windows and balcony. But perhaps in some great show of foresight, the roof of the enclosure was designed with two arches, one either side of the halfway line and a roof lined with flagpoles. Very useful for a Celtic team mover at the beginning of a record six league titles in a row. Slightly further afield, several of the buildings still standing at Parkhead Cross were constructed, including tenements in 1902 and the Glasgow Savings Bank in 1908. Further along the Great Eastern Road, on a section now known as Toll Cross Road, the Parkhead Library was built and opened in August 1906. The library was funded through money donated by businessman and philanthropist Andrew Carnegie hardly as famous as Carnegie Hall in New York, but was still seen as vitally important to ensure free library access for all. Parkhead Library still stands today and is one of 2,509 such Carnegie libraries that can be found across the world from the United States to New Zealand. Much closer to home, Celtic Park would also get a new neighbour. In 1907, the London Road Primary School was completed. Built on the corner of London Road and Kerrydale Street, the three-storey red brick building and its two-storey janitor's house may have been a place of learning for some, but for others, it was a landmark on the way to the game. Do you think the Ibrox disaster in, in 1902 uh, had a, an influence on the stadiums and how they were built uh, so that it wouldn't happen again? I think you can start to see the other thing I think you can see in the, in the in Celtic as well, with the stadiums at that time, they are also looking at we are starting to players are starting to get paid money for playing football, and how do we generate? I mean, again, it's getting back to how things don't change. How can we get money so that we can pay people, which means we have to have nicer places for people to go and watch football. So they start building stands. Uh, only problem is we go and build a stand uh, with windows. Um, that steam up so that people, so the windows are shut. People can't actually watch the games. <laughs> may, may have been useful from 1989 through to 1994, actually. But um, 
Yes, you can see round about that time, people starting to think we need to do something. We need to try and get uh, more money in through the gates. So we need to have a better experience for people to come to, uh, to go and watch the football. Nothing like we would expect, but you can start to see that mentality coming through. And, and you're right, there's, there's a raft of football disasters around the, the, the turn of the century. And then, from from memory, I don't think there's another football disaster until about the mid nineteen twenties. It's a good twenty years mm-hmm. after those turn of the century problems before um, you start to see. So it's obvious that they've um, they, they've 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 improved the way that uh, football stadiums are, and it's 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 the it's the first basics of um, having a a place for people to go in a nice environment to go and watch the football. And the, the early years uh, in the in the 1900s weren't successful for Celtic at all. When you look at, you know, right up to 1904 when things started to change, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, they won the Scottish Cup once in 1900, and they won the Glasgow Charity Cup in 1902-03. And the only other trophy that they won during those first three, four years was the Glasgow International Exhibition Cup. Yes, which... Even I, I reminded myself when I, when I read about that, thinking, do you know, if I was a Rangers fan, I would be thinking typical Celtic, <laughs> because Rangers won it. Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> if I was, if you're a Rangers fan, you think from a different perspective, you'd be thinking typical cheating Celtic, because <laughs> Rangers won that, and you've touched on the Ibrox disaster. And obviously, what they are looking for is to try and raise some funds um, to, to yeah, give to the families of the, the, the Ibrox disaster, and um, and so they put the exhibition trophy up. And you can read different accounts, but certainly one of them that I've read is they put it up. One of them I read was they put it up expecting to win it. Another one was that they put it up just as a notional prize, and they weren't actually expecting anybody to take it home with them. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever it was, we thought we're having that. <laughs> what, what, won the revised competition for the Ibrox disaster and kept it ever since. And it actually says on the trophy, won by Glasgow Rangers. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. <laughs> I, I heard something about uh, there's even been recent communications between Rangers and Celtic asking for it back. They probably just want to sell it. <laughs> bit of bing, bit of bong. <laughs> so that trophy is now still in the Celtic Trophy Room. Yes, we have no shame about it. I mean, if you if you take it, you know, if you look at it, the exhibition trophy is nineteen oh one. It's won by Rangers, um, and and they win it fair and square. They have the Ibrox disaster, and they say, right, okay, we want to try and raise some money from charity. Um, and we beat, I think we beat Rangers and Sunderland. And uh, we go and keep the trophy. I'm pretty sure at the time, whether they explicitly said, this is not for winning or what, <laughs> I'm pretty sure at the time it would have been known why it was up. And you would have thought that the done thing might have been to have paraded it round and then just handed it back to them. But no, we've kept it ever since for um, for 113 years. We've kept it in our trophy room. That's fantastic, isn't it? I'm glad we kept it. <laughs> <laughs> but it just shows you a lack of plan in Rangers, uh, even in those days too, eh? Yes, yes. Uh, although, as I say, I'm sure they're sitting there going, yes, it just shows typical Stephen Celtic who, uh, who just take everything. <laughs> now, there is a trophy that Rangers won first. Clover on my breast and the green and white upon my chest. From 1901 to 1903, the Celtic shirt was still vertical stripes with a white collar which was worn with white shorts and green socks. It wasn't until 1903 that Celtic adopted what is now the famous green and white tubes which are synonymous worldwide with our club today. From 1903 to 1905, the hoops were accompanied by white shorts and plain black socks. From 1905 to 1907, the only change to the Celtic kit was the addition of a single green hoop at the top of each sock. In 1910, Celtic introduced the first ever away kit. This was an all-green shirt 
with white shorts and socks with had two green hoops at the top of each sock. The only change to the home kit between 1907 and 1915 was to wear the black away socks with two green hoops. In 1915, a slight alteration was made to the home shirt which seen white cuffs added onto each sleeve. In 1918, a white collar was added to the Celtic away kit but again this only lasted one season as in 1919 Celtic's new away kit was still all green but this time featuring a thick white V just under the collar. Again this was worn with white shorts and black socks with two green hoops. So there we moved into 1903 and there was a dramatic change about Celtic that year. There was and it's one of those things that we tend to sort of gloss over and wear the famous hoops and I, I think mo certainly when I was growing up I remember probably getting to my teens before finding out that Celtic didn't wear green and, green and white hoops from day one. Why would you even have thought that they didn't? That's the big no, question. <laughs> exactly because the general thing was Celtic wearing their famous green and white hoops as they always have type comments and there we were, 1903 was when we decided to change over. We'd obviously had the, 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 the white strip um, in the formation that everybody knows about, and then we'd gone to green and, green and white stripes. And we weren't even the first team in Scotland to wear green and white hoops. Hibs had worn green and white hoops before us. And Rangers wore blue and white hoops? And Rangers wore blue and white hoops, yes. We weren't even, we, we weren't even the first in Glasgow to wear the hoops. <laughs> Rangers or the Swifts, as they were often called at the time, they wore them before us. It's been cold in their shadow ever since, hasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, and, and um, before before we started recording this, and, and we we talked about not mentioning it, but I will. Uh, about two hours ago, I had a wee panic and suddenly thought, I know we changed to green and white hoops in 1903, but I have absolutely no idea why we changed to green and white hoops in 1903. Um, I did I, I did a lot of Googling and came across, across stuff. Many people coming up with the theory of teams don't tend to wear hoops because it makes players look fat. <laughs> I dismissed those as maybe a, a, a 21st century perspective <laughs> on things. Um, I did read one or two places that it was copying Belfast Celtic, but you might be saving the day and came up with an even better one. Well, I actually can't claim to be the person. I, I did find <laughs> this on the internet. I thought, what the hell? If, if we can steal a trophy, we can steal a quote. What about that? <laughs> yes. You can, so, so for those people listening, they can obviously see that we've rehearsed this fantastically well. Um, the odd, this is your text to me. The origin of the hoops has been passed down from generation to present day. Chains, or white, is for freedom, and green is for liberation. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I tell you what, why would we ever let anything get in the, in the way of a romantic yarn like that? Never let the facts get in the way. That's fantastic. I'm going with that one, Harry. No, I mean, it's, it's probably something simple like somebody mucked up when they were getting the jerseys made, but hey, <laughs> that sounds far more romantic. White for freedom and green for liberation. And you can just imagine the kit man coming in and handing out this strip and somebody goes, these, 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 are, these are horizontal stripes. <laughs> I mean, no, 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 they're vertical. <laughs> <laughs> I put it down to, to, to freedom, that's good. Yeah, actually, it was the kit man who, on the spot, then thought, sugar. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how am I going to explain this one? Oh, no, no, it's all to do with their heritage. It's uh, whites for uh, freedom and greens for liberation. <laughs> to a rounding chorus of a cheer in the dressing <laughs> yeah. room. We'll see go with that. See you smart guys, see you smart guys with your fancy words. <laughs> <laughs> we seek him here. We seek him there, never to find, is very rare. You can go to any single country in the world, and you'll find dedicated followers. This is Vincent from TikTok. One of my most bizarre memories is around uh, my trip to Seville. Well, we were standing in the, in the extreme heat. Uh, a bottle exploded and cut my foot. So I had I was required some medical attention. So I was in the back of an ambulance when Henrik Larsson scored both his goals. So I missed both goals and actually didn't didn't see the goals until uh, I got back home in Scotland. So 
travelled all that way and didn't get to see the goals until I got home. You never hate his colours, cos these colours, they don't run, cos he's a dedicated follower of And it was a European game. Mm-hmm. Partisan Belgrade. Oh, somebody's mentioned this, aye. And yep, it was yep. so strange. It was like, are we through? Are we no through? Or oh, <laughs> Jackanowski scored about four goals, I think. Yep, yep. yep. You're like, oh, we must be through. <laughs> you, <laughs> how could you possibly go? So, the strangest feeling was enjoying a game so much, but feeling so low. He's a dedicated Love Street, when the silence, and then the roar. Was his name Albert Kidd uh-huh. it was the second goal really because right. at the first goal the two goals came off quite quick together uh-huh. and when the second goal went in and the guy beside me his facial expression <laughs> and the radio just getting thrown up there with no care for the consequences whose head it was going to land on and right down <laughs> A wee, a wee roar coming round about and then it just exploding. Aye. You know, as it's sort of silence at first, as if he's a dedicated follower of Celtic. Oh, yes, he the boy collapsing at Blackburn. Kid when he had a heart attack. Well, to get in. To get in. To get in. Because he never had a ticket. That was surreal. <laughs> <laughs> and the boy says to his own way, we're getting in. For <laughs> Canada, he'll find him. You never hide his colours, cause these colours they don't run, cause he's a dedicated follower of Celtic. The strangest one was we travelled over to Ireland for uh, Mick McCarthy's testimonial game. Right. On the bus, we were obviously drinking jungle juice. Right. And at the hotel that night, one of the guys came down with a scarf, crying his eyes out. Asking what the score was and didn't realise it was still the same day. Oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> so, That's when, nice. so when we told him it was actually still Friday, it was <laughs> over the <laughs> So the, the, the new hoops <clears throat> that we are now all well aware of the history of the of the jersey yes. uh, proved to be a lucky a lucky omen for us because in nineteen oh four we started on one of the most famous runs in, in Celtic history. Yes, and, I, and again, um, in the history repeating stuff, when I was reading all about the, the team, because we, we, this is the first period when Celtic dominates Scottish football. We win six um, titles in a row, and, uh, and we get the first double in there. And when I was reading about it, it was uh, the two or three places more or less said the same thing. And this is the history repeating that, that we all think this money ball is a fantastic new idea. Willie Maley decided that we could no longer go on and just try and buy and cherry pick the best players from the rest of football. That we had to rear our own players and, and unearth hidden talents that nobody else had spotted and start bringing them through. Now, where have you heard that theory of late? <laughs> and in, fa- in fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a great bit in 1903 we, uh, to, to, to confirm that Celtic, um, that uh, Peter lowell has been doing his homework. Celtic in 1903 bought Jimmy Hay from Ayr for £50. We sold him to Newcastle for 1250 Fantastic. And he didn't even grow up in Kenya supporting Celtic. No, but it would be like selling one yama for 25 million quid. So <laughs> if you put it in that context, it is, um, it's a fantastic thing. But yes, um, round about the turn of the century, we decided we were going to have to start bringing our own talent through and be our own players. And that's what I was meaning when I was, when I was saying earlier about um, this is when the, it, it seems to be all about the players on the park and the football that they're achieving. And, and we start with our six championships in a row in 1903. So the hoops are a lucky woman. And that team at the time um, had the, the famous forward line of Bennett, McManamy, Jimmy Quinn, Somers and Hamilton. And if you don't know all those names, this was really one of, one of the most successful lineups ever in the history of the club. And this is really where the style of Celtic really started to stamp its authority and, and pave the way for, for the flamboyant nature of the, of the football in the years to come. 
<laughs> yeah, and it was uh, what, what seemed to, to garner people's imagination from reading the reports at the time as well is that it was a young team that these guys, uh, the forward line that you've just mentioned, it was it was guys in their early twenties. So it was young guys playing fast attacking football and and sweeping all before them. And, and that, as you say, it, the hoops, everything about what we look at as Celtic, a lot of it is set around that time. That we've got to play fast attacking football, uh, that we win things, and uh, and we're wearing the famous green and white hoops. And not only do we win uh, six championships in a row, but you, you mentioned just, uh, just briefly there, we were the first team to do a double of the Scottish League and Scottish Cup in 1906-1907. And then, even better, in 1907-1908, they won every single trophy that they entered. Now, when was that ever done again? <laughs> <laughs> yes, once again, we were first to do to do stuff. Um, but yeah, winning everything in, in, in front of us, um, Jimmy Quinn scoring a hat-trick, in front of 65 that you were talking about the stadiums. Um, it was the first time that you know, stadium crowds were really starting to, to grow and 65,000 people were there. And that then went up to 70,000 people for the 1909 Scottish Cup final. And this is where we will start to get into our conspiracy theories again because I have a, I have a specific topic I want to discuss with you, Harry. In 1909, Celtic and Rangers played the Scottish Cup final and it Ended up 2 2. And yes. there was 70,000 people at the game. And that then meant that they had to go and have a replay. And the replay ended 1 1. Now, before we get on and talk about what happened at the final whistle of the replay, there was a lot of talk at the time that some of these games ended up in a tie to make money for the clubs. Yeah, I mean, it's around that time that the phrase that we all hate, the old firm, started to come in, talking about Celtic and Rangers. And one of the reasons why the old firm phrase came in, because there was a perception that because we were starting to become the biggest supported teams in Scotland, that we were deliberately starting to draw games so that we could play each other more often. It's like the GAA today. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I never said that. <laughs> But that was, uh, it brought it home whenever I talked again to, to Paul and Jim in the, last, uh, in the last chapter, where we were questioning how much money did a team get for winning a trophy? What was, what, was the, what was the purse up for grabs as well as a piece of silverware? And when you, when you hear about the goings on then, that if there, even if there was trophy money at that time or prize money at that time, the real incentive was to get people paying their, 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 their fee in through the gate and in through the turnstiles, and that was where the club generated all the funds. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you know, talking about the, the, the cup finals there, and you're talking about 70,000 at one game, 60,000 at the replay. You know, at that, at that time, the money that's coming in, they're, not, they're paying players, but they're not playing them dr- dramatic amounts. And so you can see why the, the people start to become suspicious the amount of times. And yes, yes, um, we'll, they will have extra time in games. But we won't have extra time for the first game. And we won't have extra time for the second game. <laughs> uh, we'll maybe think about extra time for the third game that you've drawn. And all that does is just obviously um, combine conspiracy theories um, about about the establishment, which which probably tones with what was going on in Glasgow at the time, where Glasgow was quite a hotbed for the trade unions, the, the, the fledgling trade unions in the UK and the fledgling labour labor movement in the UK. So you had quite a lot of um, distrust of the establishment going on in Glasgow then. You know, quite a lot of strikes. Glasgow is at the, se- the centre of um, of the growing anti-war movement um, in the run-up to, to 1914, probably from a, um, just after this uh, cup final, but you can see that the mood's in it. Uh, you know, 11,000 workers went on strike at the Singer sewing machine factory in Clyde Bank in 1911. Uh, you had rent strikes at the beginning of the century because of um, the way the rents were going. So you can see that 
Glasgow was a place where the people didn't trust the establishment. There was a growing fear in the establishment of Bolshevism amongst the working classes. So if you then have the establishment of Scottish football allowing Celtic and Rangers to replay each other time after time after time, it's just going to feed into that culture of what was going on at the time. The wonderful thing about doing these podcasts and talking about those times is how history repeats itself, even right down to the social structure and the social attitude to things going on in our club. You, th- you think about today and you know why we do certain things and we've just reduced our season ticket prices and stuff like that. And here we are sitting in 2013. We're obviously in, a, in an economic uh, situation. And when you compare that back to the early 1900s, it was, it was exactly the same. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing that struck me when I was, when I was looking over this. Because you, you, you know, I'm thinking about, obviously... Listening to the, particularly listening to the first podcast, and 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 the the guys very perfectly set the scene of the economic and social environment of out of which Celtic was born. And one of the interesting things is obviously around about the time the turn of the century is when Celtic become a limited company, and there's there's lots of debate about whether whether it's, you know Celtic start seem to be abandoning a bit of their their charitable roots with them. Um, you know, the guys were mentioning the, the, the years when, when suddenly Celtic stopped giving money to charity altogether. Mm-hmm. But you can see that in lots of ways in society when uh, when, tax, when taxes are high, people don't give money to, to charity. And um, when, when taxes are low, actually, charities tend to get more money and, and there's, a, there's a greater need for charities. And, and, and you can see that perhaps Celtic were focusing more upon the business and the football because you had Lloyd George's reforming government of the turn of the century, that was bringing, starting to bring in pensions and 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 uh, and all the other various reforms, and um, starting to to bring in uh, the provision of free school meals and help for the elderly, and, um, and the, the first national insurance act was was coming in at that time. So, all of those social things, elements, you can see that that might be why Celtic started to focus upon football and the business of football. Because actually the state was starting to take an interest in taking care of the welfare of its people for once. But how would that welfare have been distributed when you when you look back at why the club started in the first place and the diaspora from Ireland and the poverty in the surrounded areas around Celtic Park? When you hear about these social reforms, did that affect all the population in Glasgow at the time was it was were we starting to see a little bit more inclusiveness towards these Irish immigrants uh, who have obviously been in Glasgow now for fifty years? I, I think there's a there's a marginal um, change, but I mean, as, as as we well know, well, hey, as I can testify as a, as someone who my parents are came to, were Catholic English Catholic who came to Glasgow in the early nineteen seventies. Mm-hmm. and were absolutely taken aback because they'd never experienced anything like it. To say that there was, there was a, a discernible change that we in the 21st century would notice, I, I, I don't think there was. But there was just, for the, for the working class populace in general, there was beginning to be marginal improvements in, in the conditions that they, they were experiencing. It was, there was much more um, remit given to the local authorities to, to, to look after to, to look after the people and that in its in its own right would have created the problem right yes when I, when I look back at the history of Belfast and when I went over with Marty and done the the Belfast Celtic podcast it it brought it back to even when I was at school and and, and learned about history how the population shifts in Ireland specifically at that time, how it affected social welfare and the treatment of the people. And only through reading back about this history of, the, of this time, Glasgow was exactly the same. Yeah, and I mean, it's beyond my remit. So I got to these pages and, and stopped reading, obviously. Um, there was quite a lot of um, anti-Catholic riots started to kick in beyond the 1920s. Uh, and, and don't let anybody in, in 
in Scotland tell you that it's a West of Scotland problem because beyond the 1920s, you see the election of someone on an orange ticket in Scotland, and it's not in the West of Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- those types of social issues were, were starting to kick in, but that probably coincided more with, uh, as always happens, the economic downturn of the, the 20s and, and blaming Johnny Forner or the guy who doesn't look or smell or, or talk like me. <laughs> All of that nonsense. Good evening, listeners. The time is 8 p.m. And I, Charles Lucas Winterbre, invite you to the listening hour. Tonight's program is entitled Reflections, a broadcast designed to facilitate the wandering mind to ponder. Please take your time to ensure that you are sitting comfortably. Tonight, we sit at the summit of the decade and glance back at the transpirations of the past 20 years to 1900. My wife Margaret collects newspaper cuttings. And funnily enough, this has inspired tonight's program. They document events of joy, moments of sadness, and a continual pace of change. Our first cutting is dated the 10th of October, 1903. The headline reads, Man's First Flight. This was, of course, the Wright brothers, taken to the sky for the first time. Something that has amazed us all. To conquer the open sky. The next cutting, dated the 22nd, of April 1908. The headline reads, Let the Games Begin. This was, of course, the 1908 Olympics, hosted in London. Over 22 countries participated, and what an event it was. Tremendous to see 2,000 athletes competing. And as we move on, 1912. A year of tragedy, on the 18th of April, this cutting reads, Titanic, the unsinkable, and it is important to note the question mark at the end of the headline, pointing out quite rightly, as she was expected to be unsinkable, she proved so dramatically not to be, causing the loss of 1,503 lives. Our next cutting takes us across to Ireland. Dated the 30th of March, 1912, the headline reads, The Third Home Bill Meets Resistance as the Ulster Volunteer force was formed. Protestants protested, threatening civil war. And sadly, the next few papers document the grave era 1914 to 1918. The tragedy taking the lives of British, German, Russian, Belgian soldiers in what was entitled the Great War. I do not have to remind you the sacrifices that were made during this period. Our next cutting, 1916, shows that violence was not limited to the plains of Europe. 
as Irish Republicans rose up armed with German rifles took on a five day resistance and finally my wife's finest collection of what I'm sure you all enjoy the great new art form of film and a man who needs no dates to document his achievements Charlie Chaplin the greatest actor of our era good evening and good night listeners and the the, the riot that ensued after the uh, 1-1 replay was it down to religion or was this just the first opportunity where we had these two huge numbers together in a stadium and was it because of the rivalry between the teams or was it did it start off because of the confusion nobody knew what was going on well, it, them, or? It, is, it seems to be that actually they weren't writing, writing against each other and that's why I was saying it, it, it sort of chimes with the 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 fear that the establishment had that there was a there was a Bolshevism fermenting within the the the, the working classes of of Scotland and particularly the working classes of Glasgow that was just starting around that time with Red Clydeside, because from everything I've seen, it appears as though the Celtic and Rangers fans for once. Or maybe not for once. They were all blaming the SFA because the game finished at a draw and it was the second draw, but there'd been rumours and even some of the press had talked about the fact that they weren't going to have a third replay and that it would actually have extra time. And the feeling that there was going to be extra time seems to be compounded because half the players seemed to think there was going to be extra time and stayed on the pitch. There's a cracking photograph actually on the wiki of the two teams at the final whistle. And you can see even the confusion on their face. The players didn't even know what was going to happen at that stage. Yeah, so it then became clear that there wasn't going to be extra time and it was going to be another replay. And that's what caused the riot, which went on well into the night with goalposts being used as, as battering rams and um, parts of the stadium being set on fire and um, police being attacked and... Um, Alex Salmond really would have called a summit if this had happened. <laughs> <laughs> if this was if this had happened at, at, at the time, but the, I mean, a, a good chunk of the infrastructure around Hamden was was destroyed. But that isn't the the traditional opinion you have of Celtic and Rangers. You know, traditionally we've always looked at Celtic being the the sort of left wing Labour club, and Rangers being this right wing this right-wing conservative club. But when you actually read what happened that day, it was the working-class people that yeah. were supporting football at the time rioted against the establishment. Yeah, and, um, you know, eventually they brought it under control later on at night and Celtic and Rangers were, were called together and had to pay £150 each to Queen's Park to pay, to pay, for, the, uh, to pay for, the, for the damage. But it really was all about this perception that the people running things were just taking advantage of the working class paying customer. These were working class class regions writing against the establishment. That's what it was. Rather than, you know, as, as likes to be caricatured because, because of the way things have gone in the future, um, this was the start of the Celtic, uh, of the Celtic Rangers fights. And even then, when you, you, you look at the the team that was on the pitch at that stage, and as uh, we moved forward uh, into the, the, the teens, the 19 teens, the club itself continued to be successful. It was like every trophy was practically won by Celtic or Rangers. And you see where they won it in 1909, 1913, 1914, 1915, 1916 and 1918. The team at that stage started to get the names that even we as, as probably as children 
started to recognise the Patsy Gallagher's, the Jimmy Quinns, the the Alex McNair's, you know, uh, Sonny Jim Young, and and even the likes of Charlie Shaw, the goalkeeper. This yeah. this was the team that really launched Celtic as we know it. Yeah, and you you mentioned there about the. It's the start. I mean, I think Third Lanark, I think, won the league in 03, 04. And I think it was 27 years before any team other than Celtic or Rangers won the league in Scotland. So again, the parallels come in again about uh, the modern Celtic. And although we'll uh, yeah, probably yeah, not the, have a, another team called Rangers win the league. <laughs> well, that, that's the amazing parallel. Because a team who went bust won the league. And then Celtic won the league. And Celtic go on a run of winning the league to win six in a row. Oh, I, <laughs> the irony, eh? <laughs> yes. And then the next team to win the league was Motherwell. Outside Celtic and Rangers. Oh, for God's sake, don't say that, Harry. <laughs> but yeah, it just it, it, you're right. It starts to be the domination of Celtic and Rangers coming through. You can see that in the in the attendance figures because the, you then start to see Celtic and Rangers starting to cut away from everybody else. That when, once you get to about oh four oh five oh six, Celtic and Rangers are starting to have two thousand on average at a game more than everybody else. Then three thousand, then four thousand, and then five thousand, and and really most of the way from that point on. You know, by the time you get into the teens, close to the war. Celtic and Rangers are pushing 20,000 average attendance and the next best team is at 12 and 13s. And just just to take you back a little bit because there was there was one other incident I wanted to talk about and that actually happened in 1905 and Celtic and Rangers both had 41 points at the end of the season and there was a playoff announced, uh, a winner takes all playoff to see who would win the league and Celtic of course won 2-1 to one. but this game is marked as one of the most important Rangers games in their history because this is where they started to provide a challenge to Celtic. And again, if you want to throw in your conspiracy theories, the referee that day was actually English. Yes. And maybe we have a league title decider and we bring in an Englishman to referee it. So there's neutrality and look who wins. Funny that, isn't it? (laughs) <laughs> if ever you wanted evidence, I mean, I only need this one game for evidence. If ever you wanted evidence <laughs> of what neutral officials would do for Celtic, there you have it. Not that we buy into that at all, right? No, no. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, it's it's the start of Celtic pulling the team together and the players that people would start to recognise. And getting back to my um, my other point about about uh, uh, the sort of money ball theory, it only cost us two hundred quid to to pull that whole team together, and we weren't getting a chance from anybody else except Rangers. So that's why it then becomes a pivotal or a pivotal season, because these uh, dirty um, immigrants from somewhere else are starting to win the Scottish League, and are starting to win Scottish trophies. And there needs to be a, a, a rival for them, and Rangers can offer that. The war to end all wars was on, but Celtic did not sign. The Easter rising of 16 had kept our spirits high. With Sonny Jim and Charlie Shaw and sniper Jim McCall. We sang Celtic first and Celtic last and Celtic overall. Such was the talent of this wonderful Celtic side. They were regarded not simply as Scotland's best, but as perhaps the finest team from the entire globe. William Ailey was not, however, ready to dwell on past glories. In season 1912-13, Celtic went without a trophy for the first time in a decade. And the parquet boss set about reinvigorating his team with fresh talent. He did not have to wait long to yield the rewards of his rebuild, and in 1913-14, Celtic claimed their third league in Cup Double. The boys would go on to claim a further four successive league championships, but sport was to soon become a trivial distraction. The Scottish Cup was suspended as the horror of the First World War, so both players and supporters 
swap the football field for the battlefield. Between 1900 and 1920, Celtic claimed a remarkable 11 Scottish League Championships and 7 Scottish Cups. It was an era of outstanding triumph and immense talent, an era when hoop legends were forged. Legends like Jimmy Quinn, the reluctant hero from Croy who was spotted by Willie Maley in 1900 playing junior football for local side Smithton Albion. The fearsome firepower of this humble man was the foundation on which a glorious era in Celtic's history was built. The mighty Quinn would score 216 goals for the Celts. Then there was a wonderful Jimmy McMenemy, signed from Van Cairn in June 1902. Nicknamed Napoleon, an intelligent schemer, McMenemy marshalled a Celtic forward line which bossed Scottish football for a generation. Alongside McMenemy and Quinn, the nimble feet and sharp mind of Peter Summers. They would form an attacking triumvirate which would terrorise defences. At the back, there was Willie Loney, the obliterator. Signed from Denny Athletic in June 1900, Loney was a tough tackling but skillful defender. Willie Orr was another talented back who also had an eye for goal. His pace and timing, coupled with an excellent football brain, made him unquestionably one of the top left backs in Britain. Alec McNair was a self-confessed Rangers supporter and for a light blue, but Celtic would never find a more faithful servant. Signed from Stenhouse Muir in May 1904, McNair would remain at Parkhead for 21 years, playing a record 604 games. Christened the icicle, McNair was a model of coolness and consistency. So too was James, Sonny Jim Young, a dour faced but big hearted halfback who joined Celtic in May 1903 from Bristol Rovers. Hard working and tough tackling, Young was both the heartbeat and lungs of the Celtic side. The magnificent James Hay was another fine defender who combined immense strength with subtle skill. Celtic's defence of Young, Hay and Loney was so lauded that they were nicknamed burglar-proof, rain-proof and wind-proof. There are perhaps few players in the history of Celtic though so fondly recalled as the great Patsy Gallagher. Donny Goldborn Patsy first caught the eye at Clyde Bank Juniors, but his frail appearance meant some thought the player was not physically strong enough to perform in the senior game. When manager Maley first introduced the fragile youngster to his new teammates, Jimmy Quinn remarked, You can't put that boy on the park bus. If you do, it will be manslaughter. But within the frail frame of Patsy was enough steel to build a battleship. In terms of his ability with the football, Gallagher was a revelation, a genius. He was the most wonderful of dribblers, who would tease and terrorise defenders. But his football was as effective as it was entertaining. His cheeky skills also had an end product, and time after time Gallagher would deliver a killer pass or hit home an unstoppable shot. Quinn, McMenemy, Gallagher, Young, Loney, the Celtic support were truly spoiled for heroes. In the space of 20 years, the Celtic fans witnessed more talent than supporters of other clubs could hope to see in a lifetime. And still the heroes kept coming. Among them, Jimmy McCall, a sniper, a prolific goal scorer. Peter Johnston was another courageous performer to star at the heart of a Celtic defence. He'd be one of seven players linked to Celtic who'd be killed in action during the war. Standing at just five foot and six inches, goalkeepers don't come much smaller than the magnificent Charlie Shaw, but few others can stand as tall in stature. A brave, intelligent and athletic keeper, Shaw was a cornerstone of a defence that did not concede a goal for a staggering 1,287 minutes. Goalkeeper Davy Adams was a colossal of a custodian. Then there was Willie McStay, a strong and fearless defender. 
Joe Dodds, a swift and athletic back. Joe Cassidy, a clever and gifted inside left, his wonderful attacking skills made him a Parkhead favourite. Likewise Adam McLean, a much loved traditional tricky winger. Another huge fan's favourite was Andy McAtee. The Cumbernauld born outside right was a frighteningly quick player who also boasted an equally blistering shot. The list of heroes seems almost endless. But these have been halcyon days of unprecedented triumph. The Roaring Twenties promised more glory. But as South Dakota world adopted to an uncertain post-war environment, it was clear that on and off the pitch, these would be testing times. Celtic first and Celtic last and Celtic overall. And, uh, and another thing that is, is sometimes lost in debate these days is when we get up to the start of the war, 1914. There's this common attitude that you know Celtic played throughout the war and Rangers didn't and Celtic didn't have any any players that went to the war and they were all sort of you know uh, they, they didn't support the war effort and that is an absolute nonsense when you actually do read the history of the club. You've got to put a lot of things in context when you're talking about that because first of all the war broke out and the season had begun. And everybody thought the war would finish by Christmas. So, it's easy with hindsight to look back on lots of different things. And obviously, the Second World War, there was, you know, football was very different. But back then, the first season, there was, there was no need to, to suspend the, the, the championship. Because the war would be over by Christmas. That's right. And so, it, both the Football Association in England and the Scottish uh, Football League both wanted the league to keep going. And that was thought that that would be fine because it will all be over by Christmas. It wasn't really until conscription in 1916 that people, you know, if you, if you, if you read it all through, it wasn't really until con- conscription came in in 1916 and you had the Battle of the Somme that people really started to think, hold on a minute, uh, and, and having real second thoughts about whether they should be, should be playing during that time. And one of the attitudes at that time was that football should go ahead to lift the morale of the population. Yeah, and and, and the clubs were encouraged to do that. Um, the, I mean, OK, there was no second division in Scotland, but there was a first division. And the clubs were encouraged to keep playing through that. Um, and, and I know that, as you said at the beginning, um, Rangers fans tend to talk about the fact that... Um, we talk a lot about in the Second World War, Rangers fans all seem to manage to get a job in the Govan shipyards. They talk a lot about the fact that many of our league championships were won during the, the period of the First World War. Um, but we were all being, if you read it through, all the clubs were being encouraged to keep playing through it. Um, uh, however, both Celtic and Rangers, towards the end, uh, in equal measure, were starting to get criticised. For having so many of the, for having players who weren't at the front. Uh, Celtic, there was a story, get, again getting back to the conspiracy theories, there was a story which was broken by the Daily Record <laughs> in August 1916 that Celtic had sent their players to Sea Mill for a special training, training, training day. <laughs> we were doing that right up until the, until the, the early 1980s. Uh, Celtic denied it. But did accept that five of the players had been at Sea Mill um, <laughs> for the day, and uh, and Celtic were fined because of the furor that was up at the time for having these players at Sea Mill. But I suppose the bigger story is uh, is the fact that seven Celtic seven Celtic players died in the First World War. That's right, and also uh, some of them received the Victoria Cross. Yeah, Gabriel, there was. It was um, William Angus mm-hmm. received the Victoria Cross. Uh, to be fair, I think he he, he was at Carluk Rovers by the time he actually got the by, by the time he was nineteen fifteen came around and he was playing. But seven Celtic players had died and one got the Victoria Cross. So, just in case anybody doesn't understand the situation uh, during the First World War, there was a Defence of the Realm Act 
that actually said that no footballer could be paid for football before having a war-related job. And Willie Mealy, at the time, it is, it is, it is rumoured anyway, uh, worked long and hard to get some of the players' jobs in the mines and on the, in the shipyards as well. Yeah, and but also to put it in context, it was also around the time where um, any woman who saw a healthy young man walking along the street was encouraged to give that man a white, flo- a, a white feather as, to, as a mark of cowardice that he wasn't at the front. So it's a, it, it, it's a strange time, and you know, not to get into uh, more political conversations, but I always think it's really easy for us in the 21st century to look, to look back at those times and, and, and make our own judgments. It was a really, really strange time. Uh, the war came and everybody thought it would be a jolly good luck and they'd be off to the front for a couple of months and then everybody would be home by Christmas. Mm-hmm. It was only when the guys got there and saw the, 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 the utter carnage the, the, and people started writing back the, the, the reality of what modern warfare with 20th century warfare with 19th century uh, tactics sure. ended, ended up doing for the ordinary working man. The main gist of it was vast swathes of towns went across um, en masse. Uh, the only thing that could have, by all accounts, the only thing that could have possibly stopped Celtic's domination at that time was Hearts. But the Hearts team en masse went across to the front. And very few of them came back. Well, but Celtic at Celtic Park had offices where you could go and sign up for the army and all the services, and that was that was actually at the stadium. Yeah, and that's you, you mentioned the fact that, that football was very much encouraged at the time, and that's one of the reasons why football was encouraged at the time because it was a way of getting the masses into one spot, and then you could do things to whip up, to whip up further. Mm-hmm. As I say, very different times. Back then. So why was the Scottish League allowed to continue and the Scottish Cup was suspended? Well, the Scottish League was allowed to continue to to keep morale. At the time, the Scottish Cup was considered to still be a slightly more prestigious competition. Mm -hmm. So it was considered to be the right thing to do to to suspend the the Scottish Cup, but keep the day-to-day league business going on. As you say, to keep the morale going. Uh, and and to find a way to get vast ways of the general populace there. And even at that time, and, and probably right up to, to more modern times as well, the Scottish Cup always took precedence if ever there was a clash. It, it, it's strange, actually, because when I read that, I thought, but surely you would have then kept the more prestigious competition going. Exactly. But I think they just wanted the the daily or the weekly nature of the, of the league competition in that format. And it kept all the teams who were playing in the first division involved all the time. And so you had weekly events where people could turn up and you could do, use them as recruiting grounds. Uh, it's the only reason I could think of when, as you say, the Scottish Cup was the more prestigious competition at the time. And anybody coming back or anybody uh, that was involved in the armed forces, there was a lot of games at that stage where they were, were admitted for free. The whole concept at the time was that these guys were, were heroes, so um, you could be a hero too if you went off to the front, so that's why they had them as recruiting things. Patsy, you, you mentioned Willie Mealy getting people jobs. Uh, Patsy Gallagher took it a wee bit differently. Uh, he, uh, was he five foot seven or, or, or five foot six? Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, if you look at the height, before I go into Patsy Gallagher, another thing about why Celtic were formed. Celtic were formed to put food on the dinner table of the poor children. And again, looking at the social economic thing, the biggest reason for a small population is poor health for children. Mm-hmm. And if kids are, are not are regularly suffering from illnesses and are not being well nourished, between particularly between the ages of zero and three, you end up with a small population. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's anything, I don't think it then is, would come as that much of a surprise that when you look at the average height of a lot of the Celtic players around that time, they're all quite small. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you've got the famous Patsy Gallagher at five foot seven and nine stone, but we have a five foot six goalkeeper. Charlie Shaw was five foot six. So, um, and I think Jimmy Quinn 
was was talked about as being this masterful, tall, broad-chested, broad-shouldered guy that was, you know, a battering ram for Celtic up front. The mighty Quinn. The mighty Quinn. Um, but he was certainly under six foot. The second decade of the 20th century saw very little change at Celtic Park. Aside from the cement cycling track being converted into terraces in 1914, further increasing Celtic Park's capacity, it was events off the field that would eventually dominate everything. 56,000 spectators watched Celtic and Hibernian play out a 0 0 draw at Ibrox in the Scottish Cup final of 1914, and when 40,000 spectators packed inside the stadium for the replay, which Celtic won 4 1, little did they know it would be more than five years before they would see another tie in the competition. The Scottish Cup did not take place between 1914 and 1919 due to the Great War. However, league football continued where possible. Even that was not without disruption however, as players were restricted to £1 per week and many took up their old jobs or helped the war effort in other ways. Often Celtic players would be found down the coal mines, in munitions factories or working in shipyards. Some even enlisted, never to return. Your country needs you, was the slogan on the recruitment posters, and the city of Glasgow provided many men for the Army, Navy and Air Force. While most served for local regiments, many others served for regiments elsewhere in Scotland, while others still could be found fighting in Canadian, Australian and even Egyptian forces. In all, 17,695 men from Glasgow never came home. Among the overall dead were the names of Lee Roos, Patrick Slavin, John McLaughlin, Peter Johnston, Archie McMillan, Donald McLeod and Robert Craig. Men who had been on Celtic's books who died fighting for their country. William Angus was another Celtic player who fought in the war and was awarded the Victoria Cross for bravery as he saved a fellow soldier. Although Angus lived, he would never play again as his bravery cost him an eye and damaged his foot. It wasn't just the people affected by the war in Europe. Celtic Park itself was used as a place to recruit for the war effort and indeed an exhibition of trench warfare even took place inside the stadium. Even the fixtures themselves were affected, never more so than on April 16th, 1916. On that day, Celtic beat Wraith Rovers at Celtic Park before making the short journey to Firth Park in Motherwell where they beat the host as well. To play two games in one day is remarkable. To win them both is outstanding. Despite the horrible news from the continent on an almost daily basis, football at home continued. For a time at the beginning of the war, there had been an initial reaction by the authorities to suspend large gatherings of people for safety reasons. However, it was quickly realised that football was giving people a distraction from the war. Attendances continued to hit staggering heights, with 70,000 spectators attending Hamden Park for the Glasgow Cup final between Celtic and Rangers in October 1915. It wasn't just football being played at Celtic Park. At the end of September in 1918, 12,000 spectators watched an international sports event. With participants from Poland, Italy, Belgium, France, Greece and South Africa, the event was supported by Glasgow's Lord Provost and even Field Marshal Haig. Perhaps one of the more unusual sports to take place within Celtic Park was that of baseball, as two teams representing the United States forces played an exhibition game. The almost uniquely American sport aside, more regular sports including the 100 yards dash, the 1 mile run, the high jump and the tug of war. Fortunately, that tug of war was quickly followed by the cessation of real war shortly afterwards. When the Scottish Cup final returned in February 1920, 35,000 spectators saw Celtic beat Dundee at Dens Park before another 70,000 spectators witnessed Partick Thistle's defeat at Celtic Park. It was a welcome return for the prestigious tournament. And even when you, you, you know, I was reading the, the uh, Jimmy McManamy book uh, during the week there, and it was always said about Jimmy McManamy as well, that, you know, he was so lightly made up, he would never make it in Scottish football, you know, he'd be too easily injured. But even though the tactics and the, the, the way people played football, and even right down to the equipment that they used, uh, was a lot tougher than what it was today, that brings it into perspective just exactly what you're saying. The, the, these weren't big hulks of men. In a lot of occasions, um, yes, it was tough, but the sort of lightly made up guys and, and as the, you know, the style started to change, that was what really made Celtic different. Yeah, and, and as I say, it, it, it might have been a consequence of the, the gene pool from within which we were recruiting in general. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, so getting back to, to Patsy Gallagher and you're getting them decent jobs, because Patsy Gallagher had the skill and, and obviously football was not the sports science that it is today, and, and Willie Mealy um, saw training very much as stopping people turning into John Hartson. <laughs> or Chris Collins. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, if you were reasonably fit and a decent player, training wasn't essential to go to. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's a few things about because Patsy Gallagher was such a good player and because at only nine stone there was nothing to him, then he was considered to be exceptionally fit and was allowed to miss training quite a bit. But when you then read that during the war when he was getting to work um, to, in, in an important job to avoid um or to, to, to allow to keep playing for Celtic. Um, and you find out that he was uh, convicted by the Munitions Tribunal of bad timekeeping and attendance at the engineering factory in Dalmuir. You then wonder if he maybe just wasn't, he didn't turn up for training because he was so fit. He maybe just didn't turn up for training because he was a bit lazy. <laughs> he, made, he made a pain. And actually, this is my favourite story about Patsy Gallagher. And we actually... You, and also, we haven't had a conspiracy theory now for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> yes. Keep going. <laughs> Finish the story. <laughs> um, so, yes, he was uh, he was suspended for five weeks and Celtic were fined £25 for playing him after his conviction came to their knowledge. And banned for five weeks? Yes. So, if you remember back to George Kadari and delays getting signings made and all the rest of it, they, they banned Patsy Gallagher for five to six weeks for being late for work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Magnificent. Magnificent. So, like, we also, talking of, uh, just because we've moved on chronologically, but since we're, we're talking of conspiracy theories... We have also missed the conspiracy theory of the mighty Quinn being sent off in the 1904-1905 Scottish Cup final. Oh, you're loving this, aren't you? <laughs> I, I just, it's, it's, a, it's great quotes when it's things like, a controversial Scottish Cup semi-final at Parkhead saw Celtic lose 2-0 to Rangers. Jimmy Quinn, who was, the first, who was on first name terms with most referees because he was such a gentleman, was ordered off eight minutes from the end for what the referee... Tom Robertson saw as him kicking the Rangers player Alec Craig in the face. Later, later, nobody could. None of the journalists reported this kicking in the face having occurred. I don't even think about that. I mean, to get sent off, then you practically had to kill the guy on the pitch, right? Yes, exactly. I mean, we've all seen the videos from twenty years later, and this was worse. Of you know, was it um, was it Davy Adams? The, the, the first, the, the Celtic keeper during the, the six in a row, who ended up having to chuck it because he got so many injuries. Oh, my God. Because he met at times he had broken limbs or busted jaws and, and all this sort of stuff of being a goalkeeper. And there is Jimmy Quinn. Um, it was actually one of, you know, obviously the, the, there's, the, there's the famous um, uh, Scottish Cup riot uh, that we just talked about in 1909. Yes. But it did create a pitch invasion when, when the mighty Quinn was sent off in that cup semi final to Rangers. So, um, Hugh Dallas again, has, <laughs> Hugh Dallas was not the first referee sending off a Celtic player that caused problems at a football game. <laughs> and probably 19- won't, won't be the last. <laughs> no, 1904 5, when the mighty Quinn was sent off for a fictitious kick in the face. Harry, you're just paranoid, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> Where do you get this paranoia from? If you know your history. <laughs> But even during the war, Harry, there was the Navy and Army War Fund Shield, which was a new trophy and a one-off, and again, in the Celtic trophy room. Ah, well, um, yeah, you're right. Spring of 1918, Mm -hmm. and the reason for it, I think at that point, everybody knew the war was coming to an end. Uh, The Americans were just joining the war, and they talked earlier about, um, you know, I think... Just going on after that, they didn't. When they were trying to start the 1918 season, it was pretty much trying to start it as, as normal because everybody knew that the, the the war would be finished before the season finished. Um, so they had the the, the Navy and Army uh, Fund Shield, which was was set up to raise money for for families and and for soldiers returning back. And Celtic won it. Um, Celtic played um, Queens Park in the quarter final. 
um, and won. Uh, they beat Clyde Bank, who were a new team, because one of the things they'd done during the war was get rid of some of the teams from uh, far away. Basically, they, they did one of my theories for modern football. They got rid of some of the Diddy teams and then just, and then just invented teams that were local, <laughs> that was more convenient for people to go to. So Clyde Bank were invented around the time of the war just to have a more local Scottish team. So Celtic beat Clyde Bank in the semis. Uh, Morton beat Rangers in the semi-finals, and Celtic played Morton in the final, and uh, and Celtic won. But they didn't but, lift the trophy. But they didn't lift the trophy because they were told that the trophy wasn't ready yet. Not only was the trophy wasn't ready yet, but it didn't matter because this competition was going to be annual uh, to raise. Once the war was over, it was going to be an annual thing to raise um, to raise money for the veterans. It was never annual, and uh, nobody has ever found any evidence that Celtic were ever given the trophy. So the trophy doesn't actually exist? No. Apparently a guy called Craig White sold it in the... <laughs> <laughs> we should have just got a bottle of Lucas and stuck it in the trophy cabinet and called it the uh, Army and Navy trophy or whatever it was. <laughs> yes. The Loving Cup or whatever. The Loving Cup. <laughs> yes. What was your favourite Celtic moment? It's got to be 67 and the European Cup final. And nothing can beat that. And I can remember the day after that it was my first year in secondary school and school didn't start until about lunchtime and we just ran around the playground everybody uh, uh, on each other's, each other's shoulders to celebrate in that event it was fantastic it was footballing the best time uh, it was stopping ten in a row I remember I, I was living in London in Kilburn at the time which is an Irish, Irish area and um, the game wasn't on TV, and I sat out in the backyard, and I had the radio on, and they kept going back to Celtic Park and to Tannadice, and then eventually when we won, I got up, I got up and I had to jump up and down in the garden, and then walked out the front door, and I walked out the front door, and I looked up the road that I lived on, and there was loads of front doors open, there was probably three, but it feels like there was a hundred. And we all walked out the front door and over to the pub and jumped up and down and you know like so you're miles away from it and yet the family is all there. We had a good drink and we enjoyed it. I think that was the best. My favourite Celtic moment was when I walked. I was late for a game. Celtic were playing Barcelona in the UEFA Cup. I walked out during Never Walk Alone. And I've heard a lot of a lot of noise at Celtic game, but I've never heard this amount of noise. I mean, Alan Thompson put the ball past Victor Valdez. I've never felt euphoria in my whole life. Greatest Celtic moment ever. Uh, but I say my favourite Celtic moment wasn't in real terms long ago. It was the, the, when the final whistle went against Boa Vista. That was my favourite Celtic moment, bar none. Two hours before kickoff in Seville. Me and my son, you, Gary, <laughs> were walking down a big, long, straight road in Seville. And my brother-in-law, who Patrick Dempsey, who was my mate I grew up with, he started off singing James McGrory and Paul makes it right. He started that singing, and the whole lot of people we were walking with were singing it. And all you could see is Shelly fans for miles. But at either side of the road, there was orange trees growing Orange of them, an old Spanish woman holding like uh, babies in their arms, and a sea of Celtic fans just going towards the stadium. This big straight road, it was just like magical, absolutely magical. Probably 1988 centenary season. My dad took me and my brother. I was probably 14 at the time, 13, 14, and my brother was nine or ten to Celtic Park and we beat Dundee 3-0 and there's about 90,000 in the crowd we won the league in the centenary season that's my favourite Celtic moment oh, my first time at Celtic Park lovely I, think of, I don't think I've found it yet I think, really? I think we still have so much to offer and I still, we, are, we still have so much to give football. so here we were at the, at the end of the First World War and Glasgow, like like all the you know all the rest of the major cities around the UK, um, was in a, in, a, in a fit of depression again. Well, you had all these guys coming back from the war, and what what you'd had was it was a change in the profile of people working, and not as dramatic as uh, post Second World War, but you'd obviously prior to the war you did the suffragette movement, 
and then you'd, you'd had women getting jobs uh, that people didn't think what they, you know, it, it was the right thing for women to do, such as being as conductors on trams and things like that. So you'd, uh, like any, like as we've seen from many many of these major events, it just it transforms society. But you then had these guys coming back to a transformed society. Um, you had what coming back a, a, across Europe of um, of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. And, uh, and the, the people uprising, you were obviously changes were happening in Ireland. And with the large Irish Catholic population in Glasgow, um, allied to the general uh, Bolshevism that was, that was perceived to be existing amongst the, the workers, uh, there was a real fear in the establishment that Scotland was going to, to be at the forefront, or certainly central Scotland was going to be at the forefront of a revolution. Mm-hmm. And fears that you could have some sort of uh, armed militia going around, getting uh, getting arms from across just across the the Irish Sea, coming into Glasgow, and so there, there was great fears, and there was, um, as I said earlier, there was there was lots of um, things going on. You had um, you had William Gallagher um, at the forefront of it, who later became the first communist MP in the UK. So you had real left-wing fervour occurring. And to put in context, now, I've only ever been told this once, but it was a very old man who told me it. So, I've, and, and he was an honest man, so I had no reason to disbelieve him. But to put in context of the, the type of fear that existed, and I know it's out with my 1900 to 1920 period, <laughs> but the Senate... You're just showing off now. <laughs> but, the sen- but the Cenotaph in, in George Square was put where it is to make it more difficult for, for a storming of the city chambers. So that helps to put in context this sort of uh, industrial element within Glasgow. And at the turn of, nine, just after the, the, the war, at, um, at, the turn, at the turn of the year in 1919, was the Battle of George Square, which is often referred to as Bloody Friday or Black Friday, where um, you had... Um, people striking in the uh, in the streets, and it was a, a, a mass action. The, the Glasgow police couldn't cope, and so you had the army were called out. Um, they, were, they came out of their barracks um, on the Gallagate, and uh, a, a howitzer gun was positioned right at the city chambers, and there was tanks on the streets of Glasgow. My goodness. Incredible. And could you imagine what it must have been like being a Celtic supporter and coming from the background that, that most Celtic supporters came from at that stage to have been all through the war and then you had the, the, the 1916 rebellion and the attitude towards the Irish probably in the rest of the, of the of the British Isles at that time. And still, the war was now over and here was this social movement gathering momentum. How would you yeah. have felt as a Celtic supporter? You know, I'm, I'm sure... The discrimination and the anti anti Irish feeling was probably higher than ever at that time, and it, and it must have been. I mean, it's really imp- as I keep saying. Sometimes you look back in these things and you, you look at it with twenty first century eyes, but it's really difficult to comprehend as a Glaswegian. Tanks on the streets of Glasgow, and when they're when they're mobilising the troops, one of the things that the um, Field Marshal Robertson specifically did was removed because there's, there's obviously there was there was the Mary Hill barracks. Yeah, it talked about the the the, um, the tanks that were stationed that were located in the Gallagate. and so what they then had to do these, these are obviously I think it was the Argyll and Sutherland and the the Highland Infantry and things like that. But he instructed that all Glaswegians be removed from those ranks mm-hmm. because they because they feared obviously. That the Glaswegians within the ranks would to get access to guns and tanks. Mm-hmm. So you had ten thousand troops arrived in Glasgow on the Friday night and the Saturday to occupy the streets. But the period that we are looking at from nineteen hundred right up to nineteen twenty, it was the it was the same even then. Of here you have this mass of Celtic supporters travelling 
throughout Scotland because now we had we had fans going to away matches and uh, organising into into uh, supporters clubs and things like that. And as they travelled around Scotland, they must have faced an awful lot of resistance and resentment when they went to certain parts of Scotland. Yeah, and it's interesting because um, the guys obviously in the last podcast had gone through the long litany of of Irish teams. Um, and the period that we're talking about, 1900 and 1920, is when all those alternative Irish teams stop. And you just get a sense that in the rest of Scotland... The, the, the sort of the, the, the Irish immigrants coming into Scotland were really concentrating around Glasgow, and that you, you didn't have the same ongoing movement in the rest of Scotland. So, as you say, as as the so people became more mobile with the improvements in transport in, in trains in particular, um, and and are starting to be able to get to other parts of Scotland following their team, you can just feel this building sense. Of um, of dislike and and obviously any time you uh, talked about the, the the guys coming back from the, from the war and uh, jobs not being the same, mm-hmm. um, women working, women getting the vote, women got the vote in nineteen eighteen I think it was. Um, so you've got all this social change going on, and you blame outsiders when that happens. And still, you had a team that in that period won eleven Scottish League championships, seven Scottish cups, eight Glasgow cups. 11 Glasgow Charity Cups, the Glasgow International Exhibition Cup. Sort of. Sort of. (laughs) And the Navy and Army War Fund Shield. So when you think about what the club achieved during this period, despite all of the the goings-on off the pitch, both in the boardroom and on the streets of Glasgow, that's pretty remarkable. It is. and, and, And as you're reading that out, and as you go through the history, and you start to think, and... In some way, the, the easiest thing is to then try and think of, of countries today with this upheaval. Imagine all of those things going on. You know, the, the, the singer strike and the, and the, and the, the, the rent strikes and the 40-hour the strike which led to the Battle of George Square and all of that stuff going on. A club being at the centre of it because we were formed for, for want of a better way of putting it, socialist reasons. So a club who's at the centre of all of that and coming through, how much you, you can then start to get an understanding as to why the establishment of Scotland really started to build behind whoever could compete with Celtic. And probably some people listening to this chapter may think we've talked an awful lot about the, the social strife of, of Glasgow at the time. But you can't move away from what was history. And sometimes history gets romanticised and gets, you know, changed conveniently. But when you when you look at what was going on at that time, it's part and partial with the identity of the club that we know today. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you, yes, you can, you can sit there and we could have sat here and we could have talked about Patsy Gallica at length. And we could have talked about him putting the ball between his feet and somersaulting into the back of the net. Mm-hmm. And we could have talked about the mighty Quinn. And and in, and in some ways, one of the other things when, you, when you're going through this historical period, you realise that the, the problem of trying to do, as we did a few years ago, a greatest ever Celtic team. Because how can I and you say that Henrik Larson was better than Jimmy Quinn or Patsy Gallagher? It's impossible to do that. Because when you read some of the stuff going back, I'm sure the people who were going to see Celtic back then would have thought that Adams, McLeod, Young, Weir, Bennett, Hay, McMenemy, Hamilton, Quinn, Summers were the greatest people who would ever wear a Celtic jersey. Yeah, that's right. And probably were, if you look at the trophies that they won. I mean, pretty much that team played from 1905 to 1910. That was virtually the team that played all the way through. But in the, in the type, of, uh, type of podcast you're doing, it's also important to set that in the evolution of Celtic, which came out of the city, that came out of the immigrants that came in and then came out of the, the, the politics that was going on in the city at the time. Absolutely agree, Harry. And uh, that's the whole point of, of doing the podcast, to make sure that we 
as as fans and supporters of the club tell the real history of Celtic. And we're not gonna we're not gonna dress it up, and we're not gonna tell lies, and we're not gonna manipulate some of the facts and figures. This is the true history of Celtic, but it's important that we bring out the whole social aspect of more than eleven guys on a piece of grass, because we all know that the Celtic is is different in that respect, and I think that's what why we all get attracted to this phenomenon. And, uh, and I would, I mean, obviously people listening to this, I, I would urge anybody to go and then start reading some of this stuff because it does remind you of some of the romanticism about why Celtic is more than a club. For any, whether people dip into this one or the last one or the next one, whatever it is, there's a special bit, having done what I've now done now. <laughs> because everybody listening to it knows, as we, as we talked about before we came on, Willie Mealy's a manager, uh, the mighty Quinn and Patsy Gallagher were playing at that time and Celtic won things. And you then start reading into it and you read about Patsy Gallagher getting suspended for five games and the like. But there's more to it than that. Couldn't agree more. Harry, this has been absolutely fantastic. Really, really interesting. And uh, hopefully what we're doing here will will entertain people as well as educate people. And uh, if you do know your history... Sometimes there's wee things in there that you didn't know. And with that, I think we'll leave that tonight and we'll uh, look forward to run this again into the next decade on chapter number three. So, Harry, before you go, uh, with all the guests that are coming on the History Podcast, we are, of course, trying to raise some money for charities. And yeah. I'm going to ask everybody that comes on to nominate a charity of their choice that will benefit from any of the funds raised through the Celtic History Podcasts. I will nominate the Multiple Sclerosis Charity. Fantastic. Superb. So, Harry, thanks very much for joining me. And I really enjoyed the chat. It was, was, was great laugh. Good fun. But as I said, more than anything else, it's very informative. And I hope everybody gets something from these. Cheers. Thanks, Lorcas. Wonderful. Thanks, Harry. Talk to Cheers. you soon. Cheers. So there you are, lads and lasses. That's the end of chapter two. Many thanks to Harry Brady, of course. And you can visit the Multiple Cirrhosis Society at mssociety.org.uk. And of course, this chapter couldn't have occurred without the help of, obviously, Harry. The Human Torpedo, Chris Cuyava, Stuart from the CelticShirt.co.uk, Richard from the Carlux Shamrock Supporters Club, Guy from Bristol, Kelly from Stonehouse, Charlie and the boys and the wakes for the music and uh, most importantly everybody's little sound bites that you have been sending in and they are really fantastic. So keep the sound bites coming because there's still another eight podcasts to go and what I'm looking for is where were you when the Rebels won? What will the future hold for Celtic? Ever met a Celtic player? Your best away match? What did your daddy tell you about the Lisbon Lions? Who's Celtic's best ever striker? Who's Celtic's best ever playmaker? Who's Celtic's best ever goalkeeper? And who made you cry whenever he left? So there's loads and loads of things we want to put on the podcasts. And the only way to do that is record your little sound bite and email it to lostboys at gmail.com. Okay, let's talk a wee bit about donations. So we've had over 2,000 downloads of Chapter 1 first, and we haven't even had 200 quid donated yet. And some people have sent more than a pound, let me tell you that. Thanks very much to everyone who has sent in a few pounds, and that's very much appreciated. But if you're downloading these, come on, do what's right, and uh, send in a pound, 50p, a fiver, whatever you can afford. And the links to that are on HealHealMedia.com, where you can donate through PayPal, or all major credit cards. So this has been Chapter 2 of 10, and there's still a lot of weeks of this to run, and an awful lot of people have put in some really sterling work to get all this in place. And it would be nice at the end of the season to be able to contribute something that will make a difference to the charities. And really, 200 quid between 10 charities is £20 each. So... Get your donations in if you enjoy it. Send us a few quid and uh, I'm sure everybody will benefit from that and it'll make us all very proud. So chapter three will be up at the weekend, hopefully, and it'll be with Paul Larkin, who needs no introduction to anybody that follows any of the Helio Media podcasts or any of the stuff online. And we'll be covering the period 1920 to 1930 and it's shaping up to be another cracker. Absolutely cracker. And we'll announce the next guest at the end of chapter three. 
So that's it for chapter two. Looking forward to talking to Paul during the week and playing us out are going to be your confessions. And keep them coming and send them to the same email address, lostboys at gmail.com. My name is Chris McGuigan and you're listening to the Celtic History Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you in chapter three. I've recently taken my grandson to his first Celtic match. In fact, it's the first live match he's been to in his six years. It doesn't really seem that long since I took my son to his first match, and it's that bond, that continuation, which gladdens my heart. I used to say to my son that I regretted that unlike me who managed to get to Lisbon, he probably wouldn't get to a European final. But know what? We both went to Seville. Whether or not my grandson gets to a European final, I can guarantee he'll have highs and lows as a Celtic fan. The highs will exceed the lows, and more importantly, he'll learn what being a Celtic fan means. We'll teach him respect, we'll teach him sportsmanship, tolerance and strength, and what it means to follow Glasgow Celtic. Hi, I'm Michael Greenwell, and it was 1991, Celtic 3, St Johnston 0. One of the worst times to be a Celtic fan. I used to go with my big brother, but he couldn't go that day. I think he must have been working. And I was only about 13 years old. And I was on my own there, in the jungle, in the middle, as usual. For a big bit before the game, I was screaming away at the top of my lungs. Na, 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 na. And nobody's joining in with me. Nobody at all. I think it must have been the general malaise at the time. Nobody was really wanting to eulogise about that Celtic team that was doing so badly. Kind of getting annoyed and nobody's joining in. And suddenly this big guy who used to stand behind us and roll joints quite often and just comes down and joined in with me. I think he must have been listening and was taking pity on me or something. Na 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 na. And everybody started. He pats me on the shoulder and goes, there you go wee man. And then went back a few people back to where he had been before. After we'd won the game and everything, went back home that night, turned on sports scene. Tommy Coyne and Jerry Craney are standing there ready to take kick off. And just at that moment, the song that the guy had helped me to start came through loud and clear on the TV. Na, 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 na. The feeling you get with something like that when you're 13 years old just can't be beaten. So uh, hail, hail to everyone. That's my story. Hi, Chris. This is Paul from Glasgow. Uh, one of my favourite ever Celtic memories was the 2004 UEFA Cup game uh, the, against Barcelona in the new Camp. I uh, travelled out to the game with my dad and brother and sister and a good friend on the morning of the match. Uh, soaked up the atmosphere and some sunshine, um, spot a lunch, a couple of drinks, uh, headed off to the stadium and got absolutely soaked to the skin in one of the biggest downpours I've ever seen. So much so that we were ringing our clothes out on the bus on the way to the stadium. Um, made it to our seats at the very top of the ground, uh, a bit chilly by that time, seeing as we were soaked through. Uh, everyone knows how the game went, you know, a nail-biting nil-nil, one of the, the best nil-nil games I've ever seen. But the real thing that sticks in my mind is after the final whistle, making our way back out the stadium uh, and everyone singing down the ramps all the way through the stadium and you got to the bottom and you could still look up and see the Celtic fans coming down, still singing. It was just a fantastic atmosphere, a great day and a great memory.